all about mental health. Um, thank you for coming. I know this is your Saturdays, your weekends, so giving us your precious uh, weekend to us. Um, we've got a very interactive session planned, so this session is going to be very interactive. If at any point you want to ask a question, just put your hand up and the individual will sort of take the question as it is. If you are too shy to ask a question, because I understand this is a bit of a touchy subject, there's a slido.com and our code is A530. So we can, we can also ask a question on there and then I'll sort of ask it on your behalf if you don't want to sort of, you know, verbally say out loud. I understand this is a bit of a touchy subject for some people, so whichever one works for you. But it's a very interactive session. This isn't, this isn't like a lecture or a seminar. This is very much of an interactive workshop. So please, 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 uh, you know, feel free to ask questions. The second thing is, is we know this is a taboo to topic in the, in the sort of art community, right? Like if I tell my mom about mental health conditions, she'd be like, okay, but yeah, you know, you know, you know. So I know this is like a, a, a new topic that maybe we're not used to talking like, you know, out loud about these kind of things, but please do sort of push yourself out of your comfort zone as much as you feel to. Um, you know, I think this is a safe space. I don't think anything you say here will be taken like, oh, she's got this problem or, she's, or he's got that problem. It's a very open and safe space. So please feel free to ask questions. Like, there's no judgment here whatsoever. Like, we, unless you've killed someone, this is definitely <laughs> the only, that's the only if, if, if that's what you've done, just keep it quiet. <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so please, like, like push yourself out of comfort zone. Ask questions that you wouldn't normally ask. And then um, I'll let Nikki do this for the rest. Thank you, Manish. Thank you so much. He's done my bit of, uh, you know, the initial talk anyway, so I'll probably not retire it too much. But yeah, I guess I want to start by asking, how are we feeling right now? How are we doing? Good. <laughs> yeah? Good. I can feel the energy in the air, in the room. Uh, obviously, I'm hopefully by another next five, ten minutes, we'll have more people coming in and, you know, we'll have a room full of Nepalese youth. I haven't been in a room. Mm -hmm. We've been for a long time, so yeah, I'm pretty excited about today. Um, so, just to give you a little bit of an idea of who I am, obviously we, some of you will know me, but um, some of you don't. So, I am um, Nikki. I'm a medical doctor by background, um, so I've been working uh, within NHS services for the last 10 years uh, as a, as a uh, medical mental health professional. Um, and currently working as a consultant psychiatrist in West Middlesex Hospital uh, in Isilwa. And apart from my mundane day-to-day -day job, I'm also a mom <laughs> to two beautiful children, Onik and uh, Ojaswi. So yeah, they're just chilling at home with, with their grandmom. So yeah, love them with her. Um, so, so really, mental health. Okay, so we're going to talk about mental health today. And I suppose, I guess, I'm pretty excited to share my ideas, you know, my experience and perspective of mental health to you, but what I'm more looking forward to is really share from like what Manish was saying earlier about, you know, really getting your ideas about it. And really it's also part of a shared learning, even for me, coming here and, you know, having this platform to talk about it. Um, you know, when we talk about mental health, it comes with this common stereotype of, you know, perception and misconceptions of it. And hopefully by the end of today, we can all walk out with a positive stance on it and can share our learning with our family and friends when we go home. So, so that's really the objective. Um, I guess, apart, apart from that, I, I wanted to just ask the audience, like what, what did you walk in with, you know, thinking what, that what would you achieve from today? Is there anything that, was, that you were thinking or expecting from today's talk? Yeah. 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 So perhaps also walking just with an open mind, like you know, just see what it is like, and you know, just talking about it. Isn't it? Yeah, really. That, again, that that's the objective. Um, but let's start kick start with a little exercise, as we really want to make this an interactive session. So, how many people do you think have mental health? Everyone. Oh, brilliant! <laughs> Do you like mental health issues, you mean? No, I'm just saying mental health. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because again, I put this as a, again, mm. you know, that, that is something that's like, oh, mental health, just even hearing mental health, I've, yeah. I've seen people sort of being, becoming very defensive and actually shying away. Well, no, 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 I don't have it. But as much as we have mental health, we have physical health, we have mental health, don't we? So yeah, brilliant. So that's half the job done for me today. <laughs> so the next question is, how many people would experience mental health problem at any point in their life? You think? What's the stats? Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, 
I mean, I guess when we're saying a mental problem, um, thinking about more sort of something that is uh, much more problematic than you know the day-to-day -day stress and strains that we all experience. So you mean like officially diagnosed? Yeah, somewhat. And it could be any form of mental problem, but we officially diagnose that. Eighty percent. I don't know if it's sucks. I'm glad that it's above 50% of the thing. So, yeah, it's actually 20, 25. It's not sort of like, you know, one in, one in four. So it's, I, I, I know where you're coming from. But again, here we're talking about mental health disorders. So, you know, it's, um, but it's, I mean, you know, think about it. It's one in four. Yeah, so it's common. What about at any given point of time? Let's even think about this room. And if we were a room full of 30 people, like how many of us would have? Um, but talking about our, you know, age bracket, and you know, sort of, I'm, I'm, I don't know what your ages are, but I'm just thinking sort of like, you, you know, age 16 to 24, again, this is from the um, public health website, so they have a, a specific range, and the reason being that obviously, um, this is a this is an age um, that obviously almost sort of sets the stone for people to develop mental health problems, um, you know, in their life, in their lifetime. So. It's quite important to really understand. And then here we're talking about also depression and anxiety. Like how, how common do you think that this might be the case within that age bracket? I think it's a lot more common than what it used to be previously. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do you, why, do you know why, why that might be the case? Why do you think it's much more? I think there's a lot of external factors that contribute towards it, you know, like social media pressures. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I think the, the, I think for any sort of young adult nowadays, it's, it's a lot more difficult than what it used to be 10 years ago. Exactly. So I'm not really sure as to what the numbers might be, maybe about 25%. <coughs> okay. So again, around about similar figures, and also because more people are talking about it, and more people are seeking help as well, and more people are being diagnosed as well, so you know, that obviously adds to these stats as well. So do we all know about mental health now? <laughs> <laughs> We've done a bit, a bit of exercise. Uh, but really, <clears throat> my objective for today is to um, I, I have divided into two halves. So first half we'll be talking, uh, well first about half an hour to 45 minutes, we'll be talking about mental health, um, mental illness in Nepalese diaspora, because I think that's quite important to understand the context of the social environment youth live in at the moment. So we'll talk about that in more detail. And also the science behind illness mental illness, and then we'll be spending a bit more time on depression and anxiety because this is more, much more talked about mental health disorders within, within the diaspora. Right? And the second half will be deep diving into stress and you know, its manifestations and its management. Okay, happy with that? Yeah. Yeah. And again, please ask me questions. I'll definitely be asking a lot of questions. You, you, I think by the end of the day, you'll be so annoyed of asking me <laughs> <laughs> questions. Of, please, I will, I'll, I'll, if I don't have answers to your question, I'll get back to you. I, mm -hmm. I promise you that. Um, so let's keep this really attractive. So, <clears throat> what is mental health? What do you think? I, I'm not waiting for a sophisticated answer for this one. But please give me any sort of, what do your perspective, what do you think mental health is? Brain health. Okay. By that, what do you mean by brain health? Do you mean that? Uh, like having a clear mind. That's definitely an aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like it's our mind. Yeah. Our mind. Yeah. So it's the some thoughts. <laughs> and the mind. The thoughts. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Definitely. The thoughts. The well-being. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. What do you? What other things? Uh, our focus, your mind is. Yeah. Our so focus. very much about mind. So what is it? You know, obviously we're saying things about mind, but is there anything else that is obviously very much linked with mental health? Emotions. Yeah. Because thoughts are just a part of it, isn't it? How it manifests and how it is expressed could be in the form of emotion. Actions. Actions. Brilliant. You've just hit the nail on those. Those <laughs> three are the rhythm. This is amazing. <laughs> so those are the three aspects. But again, many pe you know, different people have uh, defined it in different ways. Uh, <clears throat> and again, the general, uh, you mentioned about well-being. And um, the general theme is that it is a well, uh, you know, state of well-being not just emotional, but psychological and social. 
Um, and obviously, uh, things about sort of being able to recognize your potential, your abilities, being able to exploit it, and also being able to cope with your day-to-day -day normal stresses in life. So that clearly is. But what actually stands out for me uh, in the definition, and this is within the definition of WHO, is this sort of being able to contribute to their, to their communities. And I think this is something I really want you guys to hold this thought in your mind, because we'll be talking about this in, 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 our, in our subsequent star slides. Um, just to understand our position within the social environment and the culture that we live in, like that has a very that has a big impact on our mental health. Okay, so yeah, I mean, uh, just put this down as as a dynamic state of internal equilibrium because we're faced with different adverse events in our lives, you know, stresses in our life, and how do we maintain our sanity uh, despite that? So we've talked about mental health. What do you think mental illness is then? Of course, you know, we've talked about thoughts, emotions, behavior. Yeah, so, so what is mental illness? When we, when we say these three aspects of mental health, when does it become an illness? Probably any time uh, there's a threat to your well-being, right? Yeah. But in a way that is not, um, that is not manageable, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking on the same lines as well. But yeah, so mental illness, as you can see, there are different forms of mental illness, and uh, we won't be going into any, uh, all of those. We'll definitely talk about depression and anxiety. So it can have different disorders. You know, why are they called different disorders? Because they have their characteristic ways of manifesting, and they have certain s symptom clusters that makes it that disorder. So obviously, you know, that's the that's why we we uh, we are here to diagnose that, and you know, obviously, to recognize what exactly it is. But again, I'm, I'm glad that you thought about these three things, think, thinking, feelings, and behavior. So it is a health condition. Health condition because we're seeing mental health as also very similar to physical conditions, like sort of having a, sort of, you know, going to hospital with a broken bone, or you know, <coughs> diabetes or hypertension even. Like if you think about diabetes and hypertension, you can't see it from outside, can you? It's very similar to mental health, but then you don't, you don't have the same stigma attached with that because Suppose you could measure it, right? But you couldn't necessarily measure mental health, mental illness. And again, like you said, you know, how problematic it becomes, right? So it's, it's the severity of distress. So how much is the person distressed by it? And how it impairs the person's functioning? So be it at workplace, relationships, or even sort of activities of daily livings, like being able to look after yourself, you know, certain other things like cooking and you know, all those sorts of things. So, so that, that's certainly, um, when a mental illness is, 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 that's how it's defined. But thinking about how mental illness is defined within our Nepalese diaspora, you know, our sort of social communities, what do you think if you ask our parents or our grandparents to say, you know, <laughs> what is mental illness? What, what would they say? What do you think they would say? Crazy. What else, what else? Can you think of any other thing that they would say? Crazy, <laughs> suddenly losing control. Oh, we let the put like you. I can possessed by spirits. Yeah, and and then it comes with this sort of um, they they get into the stereotype of being unfit and you know rejected by the families and friends and you know wider society. And I think this is the point I really want want you guys to now think about culture and how that impacts impacts us as individual. Now I've got a little exercise. So the first question: How many of you identify yourself mainly with the British culture? I know that you been in this country for a bit. How many? <laughs> raise your hands. Okay. Well, like a little <laughs> bit, yeah. <laughs> of course. Really, yeah, please, please feel free to raise your hands or shout aloud. Just want to see. <laughs> Otherwise, you, can, you, guys, you guys can follow the interactive presentation in the oh, booklet. Yes, I forgot to mention yeah. about motion. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, are we going to do the group as a group or shall we break into small groups um, and do it and come back? Or? I think let's just carry on. We can actually, yeah. I think if you start doing groups, then maybe we might not be yeah. able to cover the okay, okay. other things yeah. that we are planning yeah. to So maybe you can just tick the box uh, next to where you think you fit in. We have pens here, by the way, guys, if you need them. Yeah. Okay, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> They're my pens, so please give them pen. back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I guess I'll just put those questions there on the screen, and we've got it on the worksheet. <laughs> so, yeah. 
when I ask you to raise your hands, my feel a bit like, oh, maybe I'm like a bit of both. <laughs> but yeah, so where do you identify this? Yeah. Take one for Sorry. Why she won't? You don't want to do the worksheet. Oh, yes. I'll do it. 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 I'll
I just wanted to touch upon that assimilation, maybe like just to give an experience. Yeah, please do. For example, gr like being in the Nepal side here in the UK and growing mm. up here, mm. I feel like when you're in school, mm. you feel kind of pressured to adapt to the culture around you. Yeah. Um, and it depends on the age and where you are, right? How yeah. confident you are as well. So. Just when you're in school here, you want to adapt to your environment, you want to be part of this British culture mm -hmm. and you know, try and blend in. Yeah. But then I think what's happened with a lot of people, including me, is as you've grown older and you've become more at, you know, at ease with yourself, mm -hmm. you, I think, showcase more of your identity, That's it. especially Nepali identity. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting. And how you start yeah. feeling comfortable doing Yeah, exactly, that, exactly. It? Yeah. And you start feeling, I mean, you're always proud, but you, start feeling more proud and I think it just comes it just comes with age as well I yeah. guess. I yeah. don't know how confident But I guess are, but not everybody would have a smooth journey during that sort of yeah. period of you know adopting yeah. and a lot of people find it very difficult yeah. and that's where the mental illness um, sort of you know yeah. factors in, isn't yeah. it? Um, but again with racial discrimination what sort of feelings would that evoke on people do you think? Like if you I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to be asking that question, but a lot of us sometimes may feel discriminated. But then, how how would that make a person feel? Hatred towards yeah. the person. Yeah. So you know, I don't you know I don't want to be here, or you know I don't like this. Yes. Fear as well, isn't it? Like you're sort of like you know, always sort of in that fight and flight mode. Like what's going to happen to me? Like you know, is somebody going to hurt me or something like that? Uh, so so you know, not having that feeling of empowerment, isn't it? Yeah, so those kind of feelings, and again, those are the breeding grounds for somebody to, you know, be predisposed to start developing mental health problems. What about culture and expression of distress, the second one? So the, here I'm talking about, you come in with a, a certain cultural background, and then how do you express, how does it manifest, you know, the mental health symptoms, do you think? Is there any difference? Would there be any difference? Um, you might hold yourself back. You, you're more scared about what reaction that would get, isn't it? So you'd probably not be talking about it. Yeah. Is there anything else you can think of? <coughs> In fact, why I put this there is because, oh, Shivani, what are you going to say about that? Oh, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, why I put this there is because it has been researched to say that, you know, how people express, communicate their distress is very much linked with culture, and not just culture, but also age and sex as well. So male or female or how where you are at and as you mentioned earlier Sipani about you know how you're able to do that. So why I'm how, again really interesting about how Asian uh, cultures they express their emotions and distress. Um, so somatic symptoms, though usually they present with somatic symptoms. So somatic symptoms meaning that bodily symptoms. So they would probably present with like headache, you know, looks I have a But actually the, the, these might actually be signs of somebody struggling with mental health. Do you think why why do you think that is the case? Because they might be suppressing their feelings mm. or I don't know what them for periods and then that might obviously result to some physical um, stress. That certainly is, is a factor. Yeah. But other thing is also emotional distress are not encouraged to express, yeah. isn't it? Within Chinese like yeah. culture, like you are not encouraged to express the emotional distress. And it's much more acceptable when it's physical symptoms. Oh, talk of the case, yeah, it's a headache. Then you go to a GP or a physician, and it's much more acceptable. And it's not attached with this idea of stigma in it as well. So that's definitely it. Whereas in Western culture, you're more open to talk about it, and then people obviously feel much more comfortable talking about it. Isn't it? And also, another thing is about um, you know, if you express these emotions, you might be perceived as somebody with uh, you know being weak, emotionally weak, and especially men, men, uh, men are you know faced with that, aren't they? So yeah, definitely that. And coming to more sort of like diagnosis stage, like when they come to um, sort of at the point of when do they do have a diagnosis sort of disorder, what are the challenges with culture and the diagnostic accuracy of that? Um, what Western cultures might describe as a mental illness, but non Western cultures might not, yeah. such as seeing visions. That's it, yeah. Yeah, the, the sort of even hearing voice and you know connection with the God and you know when they're religiously when they religiously practice that that might actually be within their normal experience. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Um, so, oh, I, I was going to say stigma as well. Mm. If the community, like, if you have a diagnosis, if kind of I, I guess with Asian culture, it will stick with you kind of your whole life. Oh, yeah. Like, also, like, when somebody points out the bubble, 
and it's kind of talked about in a negative aspect within the community rather than it be like, oh, Oscar Wilde, you, you should educate yourself on that. It's yeah. a common thing rather yeah. than Oscar Wilde just a woman, right? Oh. Like kind of like yeah. negative. Definitely. And I think, um, and you're so right in saying that because it's almost sort of like an economical and even the sort of given the value of that person, and not just that person, but also the siblings in the house and the other people who are yeah. you know connected with that person gets affected. The by dynamic that. of the family becomes questioned because yeah. they've been. Yeah, right. and that's definitely interesting. And I guess with the dinosaur part of the part of uh, discussion, you know, the Western conceptualization, as you mentioned earlier, about the construct and uh, how it's uh, how it's. For example, if you look at the international classification disorder, you know, headaches and backaches may not be within the diagnostic criteria of maybe saying, you know, this person's depressed, whereas uh, Asians, they may not present with the typical signs of depression, signs and symptoms of depression. So yeah, it may not be very accurate. And it was so interesting, I was just looking through um, an article that says in, within Amish culture, you know, flirting with a married um, <laughs> lady and, you know, going off uh, on holidays in off seasons and, spending a lot of uh, money on the telephone and all these are actually within their normal behavior whereas in western culture it might be seen as somebody with a bipolar illness <laughs> you know like oh my god this is like you know out of ordinary mm -hmm. so yeah again really sort of where you come from and you know how it's conceptualized has a massive impact on it and what about coping um, styles and um, s you know seeking help and i think that the stigma is definitely comes within that as well mm -hmm. and what, what are the things um, in terms of coping styles within the culture as well? I think like Asian cultures bottle it up until mm. it's like too much. Mm. Whereas in Western cultures, because you're allowed to sort of express yourself, it's kind of like continuous. Like, you know, here at my workplace, having a therapist is so normal now. Yeah. Like having a, a like a, almost everyone has a therapist at my exactly. workplace, right? Yeah. Whereas like in, in so they're, they're encouraged to sort of like release that you know the stress whatever it is like every week every two weeks yeah. whereas in like somewhere in, in the east or in africa it might be like a you just kind of like deal with it internally or you don't tell anyone until it's like the pressure's too much definitely i think i, I, I want that and, and in fact in, those, in that vein people might actually not go to a psychiatrist or like, like if you see a psychiatrist like go away it's gone and even yeah. psychiatrists even us as professionals we are stigmatized as well to some even here in western country like a lot of people do not want to see us, you know, they would rather go and see the GP because it's headache, it's backache, why would I see a psychiatrist? Mm. Uh, and also, um, sort of, you know, they would rather use other methods like Chinese sort of, med med you know, herbal treatment or religious prayer even. I have a lot of patients who are from Muslim background and they just hate the idea of medication. And in fact, in some ways, like, you, know, you do have to appreciate that it does have a lot of impact on them recovering as well. So it has to be very much incorporated into their recovery process because you know, if you say no, only medications, it's not gonna work. And it, it does help. So I think that is quite important. Mm -hmm. um, and also because of that reason, people may not go to mental health professionals and you know, and not just that, because they may not be able to pay for it as well. So there's economic barriers as well. Because you know, it's quite expensive to see a private psychiatrist or a private doctor, for example, you know. So those kind of things. And um, what about the treatment and interventions issues? So once they've been diagnosed, they've got a mental health disorder, what sort of other things might be a challenge, uh, you know, when they do seek treatment? So if they go and seek someone for help, what sort of challenges there might be? Consistency. Consistency. Yeah, so they might have external factors which come into play. Mm -hmm. So they might not be able to make it a consistent routine. Yeah, so sort of attending appointments. Yeah, we don't really understand the impact of neglect on our mental health, mm -hmm. which is sometimes why it manifests more in a physical form rather than it manifesting at a stage where you can manage it more with like, I guess, coping styles. Definitely. And also, sadly, uh, but it's true for mental health that, you know, the journey when you do have a mental disorder, it takes much longer than, like, for example, if you have cough and cold, within a week you're, you know, fit and you can go back to whereas with mental health, it does take time. It's the patience that you would require, really, you know, and that, that definitely has an impact on it. And other things also to do with, you know, the shortage of ethnic minority health professions, you know, especially around our, uh, in a Western country like this, like there may not be like 
for example, you go and see someone, our parents may not be able to talk in English, and not necessarily they won't be an interpreter. Although having said the NHS, they're really working hard to incorporate this, and you know, if you ask for it, you do get it. But you know, th this has always been a challenge, though, despite that. Um, so sometimes I, I end up becoming an interpreter for <laughs> some of my own patients, which is not great, but you know, it does help. Um, and they feel straight away very much at ease when you can talk to them in your own language. Yeah. So those kind of things, and because of all these things, people might actually prematurely um, drop out from their treatment, and that this even happens in our own country as well. So I think that does does this give you a bit an idea about culture and how it might impact on mental health? Yeah. Do we think is there anything else? I was just curious, like if some like if your um, clients or um, patients um, drop out of the treatment prematurely, what happens? Is that gonna add like more issues, like illnesses for the person? Yeah. Yeah, of course, and I think the and I think. NHS has now started to identify like people who drop out. What is the reason behind them dropping out? And ethnic sort of the culture has <laughs> has now become a massive uh, sort of reason for that. And they have lots of uh, projects going on at the moment to capture that data and be able to reach. So they have um, we have what we call as um, outreach services like early intervention services um, and recovery services that actually go to people's houses so that you know they can engage them back in therapy again or back in treatment again, so a lot of work is going around that. You know. And certainly if they disappear in that, in that process, then yeah, the process <coughs> is great. Yeah. Uh, do you have nothing to say? Do you have nothing to say? Oh yes, I was just saying to, uh, wasn't I sharing this earlier, <laughs> first at work and I actually have an epic, I had a, this is a patient that uh, happens to be mom of my friend from back home in Nepal when we did, ne you know, medicine together. So it was like a very difficult scenario where I was trying to catch up with her, so like we had to pass that and then think about, you know, what do we do for a mom. So yeah, I mean, I do get, not a lot, but uh, yeah. And is it related to problems that we just talked about? Like very much so, very much so. And this actually turns out to be from a family where there is a medical doctor in the family and still they waited until quite late, until she was very, very poorly that they had brought her to AME. So, you know, you can imagine. Just, just on that, actually, like, when you realize it's also like confidentiality. Mm. So in Nepal, like you know, it's not like it's not unheard of yeah. for a doctor to like tell your family, even if you're gonna see like a therapist like privately. Yeah. Doctor will just tell your mom because they know her or, or do they know. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's it, that's rather precious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, in fact, like a lot of people go to India for treatment because they don't want to see, and which is somehow mm. it's a small um, you know country in India. So yeah, yeah. This is true, sadly. <laughs> so, um, so we've talked about culture and its impact, and with that in mind, I just wanted to check, ask you guys on the worksheet, um, what are the challenges of being a bi-cultured individual? I'm sure there will be, and here I really want you guys to think about not just the challenges, disadvantages of being a bi-cultured, but also the advantages, of what are the positives of being a bi-cultured? Take a few um, minutes to think about it, and maybe, you know, just, you know, what comes to your mind when that question comes to you? So do you, do, do you want to share what do you think um, could be the challenges of being a bi-cultural um, Acceptance to a society. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess when I'm in the UK, I'm not really considered fully British. Mm -hmm. But when I go home, I'm fully considered British because I've lived here for so long. Yes. So it's that acceptance Conflict. within a, a society and kind of feeling like a part because as humans, we want that social acceptance of being a part of a group. Yeah. But then you never really find that fully 
no matter where you go. That's true. Definitely getting that from Feeling like more belonging. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Any any else? What what any positives on being a bi-conscious individual? Adaptability. Yeah. If you can so if you have a pretty good Natalie personality, then you've got yeah. you're able to come across quite quickly. Yes, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, it's it means, a, means that anywhere you go in the world, you can sort of fit in. Yeah, in, yeah. definitely. And language is again another thing. So you was by, you're multilingual, in fact, you know. We were talking about how we watch Bollywood movies that we can actually talk in English. Yeah, so all those kind of things. No, I, um, I agree. So I, I guess there are certain guidance of rules how our parents brought to bring us up in like, so way. Talk in a certain way, behave in a certain way, wear, wear in a certain way. Or oh, anybody is someone God, I don't know person. Especially for I, I'm, I was definitely the victim of that. Um, but at the same time, there is this, um, you know, influenced by the culture of the host country. So you know, the peers that you have, and you know, the mainstream education and media has a massive, massive role in that. Like as you mentioned earlier, isn't it? So definitely. So positives, I guess, as you said earlier about, you know, it, it does evoke a feeling of pride and. Yeah, uniqueness. So you're unique. Like you, how you can just adapt with anywhere you, you, every, every, anywhere you go in the world. But at the same time, again, as you mentioned earlier about identity confusion and value clashes, and I think again that can actually also be a sort of reason for somebody to become mentally unstable at points. You know, especially if they're being ostracized for certain things that you know they find difficult to adapt to. So yeah, definitely. Um, Sorry, I have a question on that. Mm. So how, I just had a question, how is, which, what kind of mental health illness would be linked to this? Mm. So is there a correlation, like, you know, having this bicultural identity, mm. is that going to make you, like, have, you know, maybe feel anxious mm. or depressed? Like, it could be different things, yeah. depending on the individual. But yeah. Again, yeah, you're right. So it could be dependent on the individual. But there is a very specific disorder within the uh, international classification of disorder, ICD-11, actually, the version 11. It has something called adjustment disorders. Um, and that adjustment could be fitting into that. So that could be yeah. one reason. It's not just, uh, or it could be like losing someone. So adjusting into a new situation mm -hmm. or what life throws you. So there is there is actually a, yeah, quite, you know, sort of disorder for some, somebody what does this picture make you feel? What does it evoke in you? <laughs> no, certainly this, yeah, this evokes like for me, it like evokes evokes a feeling of warmth, of sense of belonging to something, um, and it also be, be, you know so evokes some sad feelings of not going home and not seeing Tarara, for example. You know, it's sort of like, you know, it just takes me back to my childhood as well. So definitely, this uh, this really gives me all these sort of feelings, which of of course I can relate to all of you here. Yeah, so sense of belonging, really, isn't it? So. We really need to talk about this because this is again a very important part of mental health. What are we doing to develop the sense of belonging here in, in the UK, or in the Western, or in the foreign land? Nepalese society and universities, are, uh, I'm sure there are uh, Nepalese society within the university. How many of you are working closely with them? Yeah, not closely, of course, yeah. So I was just going to, you raised hand, I was going to, the question was going to be directed towards you, Pauji, like, as merging that song, so what are you trying to achieve? What are you trying to create? I think it is a social mobility through sense of belonging, using that sense of belonging as a networking platform where we can uh, kind of help Nepalese community move up the social ladder. Definitely. So it comes from a reflection that our parents are in, like, proletariat working class space, mm. and it's a movement towards bourgeoisie, which is a like a white collar professional. Mm. And that kind of transition is how we define social mobility. And to change that comes sense of belonging. Sense of, exactly. So that is the core feeling yes. that we're trying to develop here. What other things are we doing? Ethnic community groups? Obviously my husband's been sort of 
running this past the Kuchel Hotel for how many donkey years? <laughs> I keep asking, when I was like just came into this country, I was like, why are you doing this? Like you're not at home literally, you're just doing a lot of things. Like why, why do you think you're doing this? But now it kind of makes sense, like, you know, this is really to, for us to be able to have that platform to contribute and not just, you know, you know, get something out of it. Um, so yes, yeah, so Apasa Kuchel Boutique. Uh, and what about professional academic groups? So, you know, like being a doctor myself, like I've, I'm always seeking out for like, Places where I can maybe contribute, you know, go and maybe speak to people who of the same profession. Uh, even like we have Nepalese Doctor Association, Nepalese Nurses Association, who are actively not just working here but trying to find ways to help back home in Nepal. Um, again, this is to do with, you know, sense, you know, developing that sense of belonging and also, point, you know, continued political affiliation. So there are quite a lot of uh, organizations that are. Um, uh, maybe not influencing the policy making within the Nepalese government, but they're doing a lot of political, they're practicing their political um, philosophy within the Western, sort of within the foreign land. So this again is a way of um, doing uh, what, they, developing the sense of uh, belonging. Um, what would you ask your, or how would you identify, introduce a country to a non-Nepali friend? Mount Everest, that's what it's <laughs> Mount Everest. Start from there. Isn't Start it? from there and then work your way. Work your way. Food? Oh, yes. That's oh, oh. <laughs> I was like, when I was thinking about those are the main things that came to my mind as well. What else would you say to your Nepali friend? We have visit Nepal going on at the moment. Oh, yeah. um, so, what other things? Don't visit Nepal. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, of course. You know, put the. Good hands, and we're going to say something. No. You know, we have to raise that. Yeah, so costumes. You know, my son hates wearing dal so well, but I'm like, you know, you, you have to. This is a sense of belonging. You know, although he doesn't know what that means, but hopefully when he grows up. <laughs> You know, you were six and you're wearing Daura Sural, so you better wear it now. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and then charity for Nepal. How many of you, people have, you know, supported or, you know, uh, raised money or things like that for Nepal? I'm sure you could do this. All of us yeah. have done, isn't it? But why are we not, maybe we are also, you know, um, doing charity work for other things as well, but we tend to be more inclined to, you know, supporting Nepal. Why do you think that is? Why do we do that? Isn't it? We want to contribute. Uh, we don't know where, you know, how that's gonna, that money is gonna, do what it's gonna do. But at, at the same time, you, you just want to you know, get that feeling of doing something. Like earthquake, we raised about so Pastor Pujaguti raised about forty thousand pounds and quite a lot of money. Um, and then we were able to build like a school in Nepal and a few other things that was really again, you know, very nice things that we managed to. Um, so I remember this, for other political causes, I remember sitting outside with banners in, outside Qatar Embassy um, some years ago, you know, protesting for uh, Nepalese worker back in Qatar where they were not being treated well, you know, when they were building the stadium. Um, and I suppose, you know, it was just this one feeling of wanting to do something really, you know, and supporting your fellow um, brothers and sisters really back there. Uh, and again, you know, other, other protests as well, India blockade, um, before uh, the earthquake, or after the earthquake. And then, uh, this is our parents' favorite one, isn't it? The same mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> And my son, again, my daughter is fine, but my son hates to wear that tikka, like he doesn't like that <laughs> thing in his forehead. But again, our parents want you to celebrate all this. And I remember, wish you, and your team came for the same yeah. and it was amazing, you know. How did that make you feel? Well, I mean, I, I look forward to that every year. Yeah. It's like, the year of Pailo is like the favorite part of me. Yeah. You know, after the most naps to be honest, like, I love Pailo, so. You love, but then what, what, what does it make you feel? How like, does it make you feel? Well, closer to home. Yeah. Because it's Tihar and you remember the things I used to do yeah. back in Nepal when you were a kid, and then you get to do that here, so yeah. it reminds you of that time, right? Exactly. So if you feel closer to it. Yeah. So we're all doing various things, isn't it, to, yeah. to really get that feeling of sense of belonging. And I suppose we're talking about this today uh, because we is this is also again recognized that sense of belonging brings stability to mental health. It does, one way or the other. Yeah. So Sorry, it's just not to answer now, but it would be interesting to hear from people. You know, when we said, what does that picture make you feel? Mm. But what does that picture m also maybe not make you feel? Does mm. it not make you feel like you belong? You know, yeah. the, the opposite of feeling proud or feeling like home? Because 
that really depends on what you what you where you've grown up, right? So um, and you know whether you lived in the town or you didn't, how often you went there, do you have family there? Because I think for me, for example, when I was younger, I didn't that didn't feel like home, but now it does. Mm. And that's because I've gone there so often, so often, yeah. And I've got family there that mm. it does actually feel like home now. So it's interesting to look at that journey as you grow. That's definitely. Well. And also, so, yeah, yeah, definitely. And some of some of this is there is there anything that obviously Valis definitely brought this point up? Quite an interesting one. I think um, what Vishnu was saying about uh, playing Lizzie Moedo, because I think for certain individuals, and probably in this room as well, I think we experienced a lot of what, what is being mentioned here in army camps um, mm -hmm. somewhere in the UK. Yeah. It's like our identity of like this or this version of being a colleague that we created happened right from some little town in the UK yes. or etc. And and then but then when we go to Nepal, mm -hmm. then we match the previous slide that you talked about, where they're trying, where they're trying to fit in. Yeah. So it just goes to show how varied everyone's experiences are, um, which is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think the sense of belonging, it can be flipped to a positive side as well. Because let's say if you're facing quite a, quite a stressful Western life, mm -hmm. the work life and everything, you could sort of skate from there and then go back home yeah. and sort of roam into the Eastern way of life. Like, yeah. we'll take on we'll take on solid one. And it can make you fresh Definitely. when you come back yeah. to the Western world. Yeah, I think, I think yeah. that's yeah. a good point. Yeah. I think it makes me question um, if we're like all speaking to the like, sense of um, belonging because we're the first generation of like migrate, migrating families. Mm. And I feel like we're trying to build that foundation now, but it definitely triggers me if like the next generation will be like that bothered because mm -hmm. will they be that bothered? Yeah, because mm -hmm. they'll be more inclined to assimilate more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I guess that's where our role comes in. Is, you know, yeah, how yeah. do we? What do they see us doing? You know, and I suppose they learn a lot from you because your education starts from home first, isn't it? So mm -hmm. you know, and they they do get influenced by that. So it's sort of like carrying on doing what you've been doing for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so I'm just trying to get, catch my uh, <laughs> train of thought. So, so yeah, definitely. So I suppose this is quite an important aspect, and we've talked about this in more detail. Now we've talked about culture and sense of belonging also. Now just moving more towards the science, a little bit of a dry sort of thing, but let's keep this in practice as well. And you guys have been excellent on so please that over to your token. I want more of the topic. <laughs> so, um, culture is a big aspect, but what are the other things that we need to think about when we're talking about risk for mental illness? I mean, there is this biopsychosocial model, which is a recognized model, whereby it looks uh, more holistically, recognizing each individual by their uh, thoughts, they're being unique, that they're all unique, and they have their own thoughts, own feelings, and history. Um, so here you're looking at three models, so biological, psychological, social. What do you guys think about what could be the biological reasons for somebody to be at risk of developing mental illness? Uh, Jean? Jean? Yeah? Uh, I have someone in the family who will have a history of uh, mental health issues that can predispose them. Definitely, yeah. Chronic physical health, certainly. Yeah. And here we're talking about things like, um, like living with IBS. Quite extreme, but like if you have amputation, of acceptance of amput like your amputated limb, and yeah. then like living with that, or even just general, just being diagnosed with I don't know, like the autoimmune condition, and then having to accept that, and yeah, live with that as yeah. well. And especially if something childhood illnesses when you're yeah. you know you don't even know what's going on. You know. Well, what you eat as well apparently has an effect on like your gut bacteria. I've read a study yes, recently. Yes, this is a, yeah, again yeah. a massive research into that. Yeah. yeah. So what apparently you what you eat can affect <coughs> how you how you how you thinking how you feeling. Yeah, definitely. So here we what we get we are getting here is modified and non modified factors that feeds into biological, isn't it? As mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier about non modified genes, you can't do much about it. You can't, you know, you're born with it. Um, whereas the diet, the lifestyle, the medication, and you know your, your stress response and also is coming to care management. What about psychological? Then? I'm come from a medical background, so I think <laughs> like coping Everybody, mechanisms yes. and how you handle and deal with situations mm. that really affects how you do yeah your mental health. Definitely. So your response to stress and yeah, mm. definitely human factors. 
Anything else? What could be psychological factors? How you look at it as well. So, like, you know, some people can look at a stressful thing as like, oh, it's the end of the world. Other people can look at it as like it's a challenge for me to like. Oh, I think it's a how you look at things also yeah. change, like depend depend on yeah. how you interpret it. And that's called health behavior. And again, it's a recognized way of you know sort of interpreting uh, you know your, your sort of uh, whatever you're thrown at in terms of illness so some people might just stay home like i'm uh, with a cough and cold like i can't do this i can't go to work but other people might just manage to you know mm. just cruise through the day and no issues so yeah definitely those and your self-esteem your you know sort of the temperament you're born with your coping skills uh, your social skills you know some people might not want to talk about certain things your attitudes even your emotional intelligence and things like that play a part in psychological factors what about social environment? We talked about culture quite a lot, but what are the other social and environmental factors that could be risks? as well to think about what is unique for you what do you think you are more most vulnerable to and what has your life experiences been you know and stressors in your life and events somebody you may have lost or somebody you know you, you felt under threat by certain things or chronic illnesses you may have experienced um, what is unique for you in regards to uh, these things putting you under um, under the so be predisposing you to mental health so recognizing those are quite important. You know, here in those worksheets, you can work at home, you don't have to do it now, but think about those and what you can do to make it better. Um, yeah. So again, as you mentioned earlier about you know um, children with so type 1 diabetes, for example, like they need insulin right from when they're 5, 6, and then they have to live with it all their life. How is that going to impact their mental health? You know, people who, who've lo loved and loved someone they've lost, and you know, how how is that going to impact them throughout their life? How they how it shapes them as they grow. Um, so those kind of things. Yeah. So if we move on, so just going into a little bit of basics of medical, so a bit of background to the brain and how what happens in the brain with um, and mental illness. So here we're talking about obviously brain is a very important part of our body. Um, it's, Usually, obviously, two percent of our body weight, but it obviously has a huge function, and um, lots and lots of uh, billion, eighty-six billion, you know, nerves and uh, nerve cells and fibers within that, and how they communicate is through neurotransmitters. Now, why I brought this here today is to really give you an idea of what actually happens in mental disorders. So here we're mainly really focusing on three neurotransmitters: the noradrenaline, dopamine, and serotonin. And it is to show you that it's not just how we feel and you know how we're thinking, it's also to do with the chemicals that's running in your brain and how that's going to impact those things. Because these uh, neurotransmitters are directly linked with um, the thoughts processes, the feelings, and how you respond to external stimuli. Um, and for example, in uh, depression, you would be seeing less of serotonin and non-adrenaline in your brain. So what we're trying to achieve with antidepressants is that we're bringing those level up uh, and I guess when somebody is psychotic or you know they're hearing voices or hallucinating, the level of dopamine in their brain is like uh, you know sky high. And what we're trying to do with antipsychotics is trying to dampen them down. So that's where the role of psychiatrists come in, and this is what I do day in and day out, recognizing what disorder it is and how we treat them with the right medication. So I don't want to be going into a lot of details into it unless you have any questions on this, because this is just to give an idea about the chemical changes. 
what what do you think is uh, the because oh, there's like a stigma attached to antidepressants, right? Like, oh, they're not effective. You have to be on them for life. Like when you come off of it, it's very like you know you, yeah. it, it, it kind of makes you go back in. So what's your view on like antidepressants? Yeah. So again, with antidepressants, as I said earlier about how mental disorder itself is, that it is not like a cough and cold. So it does sadly that's how it, it works out. That it does take a bit longer. Uh, for uh, for any person, and it also depends on the individual how they respond to a medication. So all the medication, psychotropic medication that we use, do not work straight away unless the sedate, sedating medication that obviously makes them feel, you know, they put them to sleep and things like that. But especially antidepressants take eight, six to eight weeks to start working to its fullest. Uh, you know, so those chemicals need a bit of time to um, get properly and fully, you know, homogeneously distributed in the body, and they start having the effect. So yeah, it can be a very frustrating journey, but what really helps is that if the patients and the relatives are given psychoeducation about that and they're you know informed about it, then they're much more comfortable taking it. But yeah, and I, I agree that you know some people might not have that patience. Um, so how would you recognize signs and symptoms of mental illness? And this is something I, I suppose you know all of us um, may have some ways of recognizing it. But let's think about four main domains within that. Um, what sort of behavioral signs we'll be looking at when we're trying to recognize not just uh, self, but also people around you, family or friends, or even people at workplace. How would you recognize and what sort of signs you'll be looking at behavioral wise? What sort of things you would see? I think maybe it's mental mm -hmm. I was going to say like withdrawal from situations, mm -hmm. but then you could also do the contrary because I know some people overcompensate. Yeah. So during a time that they should be sad, they should be like taking care of themselves. They are, they are out there too much and doing a bit too much and you like you should, you should take this time yeah. to yeah like yeah so yeah, definitely so it's sort of like extreme behaviors yeah. isn't it yeah and, and yeah maybe yeah. like forgetfulness for cognitive yeah cognitive yeah so that would be good. and in fact you can start thinking about all these four domains at the same time so you have some physical signs you can look at emotional signs physical they're always tired or mentally mm. they're tired even if they've slept through the night, they still wake up feeling quite lethargic. Yeah. Um, with emotional crying, crying. Yeah, so crying. more, yeah, like if you still <laughs> cry, watch crying. a movie. And <laughs> <laughs> actually, no, I, I'm actually being serious. Like, it's good to cry because sometimes if you are if you have anxiety or you're stressed out and you have a lot of pent up emotions, you end up crying in situations um, where you shouldn't be crying, and yeah. that's because actually there's something else <laughs> that's, going that's you know meant to come that's, out. That's yeah, so you know? yeah, definitely finding out that yeah, yeah. It comes out. Yeah, and then you watch a movie and you just become emotional, yeah. whereas you weren't like that before. <laughs> so yeah, all these things. Yeah, so certainly, you know, there are. I, I think there are a few on your worksheets and for you to have been think about and put it there. Um, and in fact, if I look at those, you know, I fit into all those boxes at <laughs> in a certain point of the day, or you know. Mm -hmm. But then what? So does that make? Uh, so does that make me mentally ill? So am I mentally ill for having these symptoms? I think when it becomes a habit, without you think, like when it becomes a habit, then then I think you should see someone. Habit as in, so it's happening more, yeah. and more and more over a long period of time. Over a long period of time. Yeah. yeah. And you can't do your day to day functions. So mm -hmm. you don't wake up to go to work or you don't go to school. You don't spend like hours in your life. So it starts affecting your life daily, like negatively. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, so you're looking at these sort of the key changing behavior, which is sort of uncharacteristic for you. So it's out of character. This is not what you were like, let's say, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. This was not what this was not me. For some people, waking up at 11 or 12 is fine. Like it's normal, you know. They even, but then for some people, it might completely out of ordinary. Yeah. So we're looking at. So with that in mind, I want to talk about depression. How many of us here uh, have? been depressed or seen anybody in the family who's been depressed? I mean, again, this might be a question, you know, very difficult to answer, but I suppose this is sort of like really recognizing and understanding what depression is, because we do use this term very loosely, don't we? We say, oh, I feel so depressed, oh, I feel so anxious, uh, but does that really mean you're depressed? We, we keep saying that. That's made, the news hearing cor news on coronavirus is making me yeah. depressed. <laughs> so, but do you suffer from depression? <laughs> yeah, so, so it's, it's hard to say that, isn't it? But when we hear we're talking about depression, it's actually
addiction and mental disorder, it's not just of saying lose them and feeling low or sad. We're looking at three typical symptoms within that, uh, which is on the top, so feeling low, losing interest, or which we call anhedonia. Um, yeah, I'm sure you've <laughs> heard that before. And then increased fatigability. So these three are the main core features, but there are other symptoms within that, which is listed here. But I suppose how we, as psychiatrists, diagnose depression is by categorizing them uh, around symptom cluster. So, and that, uh, that is in on the sort of lines of severity of symptoms uh, profile. So for example, with mild, you may see just two or of the typical and then two of the other symptoms. But why is that important is that if it's a mild depression, you don't treat depression with antidepressant. So you don't start prescribing people with you know, just having two of those and two of those. Um, whereas if they're moderately or severely depressed, then yes, antidepressant plays a part. Okay? But what we are really trying to look at here is, and when we're trying to diagnose someone, is to say, as you said earlier about, you know, present most days um, and every day in your life and been there for more than two weeks. In fact, two weeks would be the cutoff for depression. And then causing significant impact, like you said, about functioning, you're not able to do things that you would usually able to do. Um, and I was thinking about this in the, in the way that, you know, you go to a cinema, you're feeling like, you know, really upset, you go to cinema, when you are able to follow the plot, you, you know what's going on, um, you're able to even enjoy it, and you come back feeling fine, so obviously you're not depressed because you know, you know, you're, there is no, uh, there is lack of response. So there is lack of response to changes when you're depressed. So even if, even if the things that you were doing before, you stopped having any interest in those activities, and that's when uh, we can say that somebody is depressed. Okay. And very similar lines on anxiety as well. So has anybody here felt anxious any time in their life? Yeah. <laughs> we were talking about stress and we... anxiety can go hand in hand. Definitely. Yeah. I was suddenly anxious, you know, or, you know, I was about to miss a roundabout this morning when I was trying to, well, this afternoon when I was trying to get here. But then does, does that make me um, somebody who has an anxiety disorder? No. no. But I guess if it was a disorder, I wouldn't be standing here and talking to you guys here. So yeah, so again, here we're looking at symptom clusters as well. So we're looking at psychological arousal and physical arousal symptoms. And, uh, there are various types of uh, anxiety disorders. We won't be talking into that a lot today, but really to understand that with anxiety comes not just the psychological, so you're sort of fearful about what's going to happen, things going wrong, you're worrying about everything, but it's also the physical symptoms. And as psychiatrists, this is the first thing we ask somebody when they say they feel anxious. Like, so what are the physical symptoms? What do you experience? Because some people might have racing heart, and other people may not have the same physical symptoms. They might have completely different symptom profile, they might just have headaches like we said earlier, or they might just have fast breathing or you know, not being able to settle and feeling restless all the time. So yeah, it varies. But again, within that, we're looking at the severity of it, so how severe it is and how it's impairing uh, in their day-to-day -day functioning. So really, um, we've almost come to the end of our first part, but here, I, I guess it's for us to really think about you know, the, the, the things that we talked about earlier. Yeah. How, how are you guys feeling right now, by the way? <laughs> are you feeling all right? I'm not yeah. made you depressed or anxious. <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, I think we've come to almost the end of um, this part, and we've covered the mental health and illness, and obviously the Lebanese like, diaspora we talked about, science behind it and different anxiety. But is there anything that sort of things that you felt you may have missed or you wanted to ask? Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yeah. But it's on antidepressants. So um, do the um, patients have the choice to go on antidepressant or is it just prescribed by the doctor and they're the ones who have the like, say on it? I think this is, again, collaborative working with patients and you can't enforce any treatment on anyone. Mm -hmm. And even antihypertensives, you can't say, oh, you have to take it. It's about the, the person having the capacity to make that decision and say that this is right for me. But as professionals, it's, it's giving them information and giving them informed choice for them to help make decision that this is what I think you need. But of course, um, we would have to give a, a sort of information in terms of like the right information to say that we feel that this is what you need. Mm -hmm. But it's obviously up to the patients where they feel. Because yeah. like from my understanding, I have like a negative light of antidepressant. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the media that's like portraying it mm -hmm. as such. But like my friend, um, he was on like antidepressant, mm -hmm. but it only made it worse for him. Mm -hmm. So when he got out of it, that's when he actually started getting better. Yeah. So like, 
No, and antidepressants all psychotropic medication come with side effects and that's again the dark side of psychotropic medication but before it starts getting better it does get worse with antidepressant and any medication um, because obviously the way the mental illness is that the symptoms don't suddenly disappear and and what has been evidence-based and again more and more research is saying that you know just antidepressant is not going to make a person feel better quicker but if it's uh, in line with psychological therapy together in combination, then it's more likely to work and be effective for that person. So yeah, I mean, I think it should be both together rather than one at a time. Yeah, yeah. I just had a question on anxiety on the, um, the previous slide. So yeah. uh, maybe it's something that I read online. So with anxiety as well, would you say that it's actually um, your internal thoughts that kind of take over your mind, so whether it's true or untrue, it, it kind of then mm. manifests into loss of appetite or like l lack of sleep, you know? Mm. So, but like for example, um, I know there's some, like I'm using the app Calm, mm. you know, it has like different mi mindfulness things, mm. and it kind of says you need to not run away from your thoughts, but kind of ride the yeah. waves. Or, and yeah. you know, let that process, because if you, the more you run away from it, the more it will just move be worse, so you just have to cope with it and just, yeah. Like so one of the feature, diagnostic feature of anxiety, yeah. so which I haven't put it here, is also avoidance behavior. Mm. So this is like innate to us as human, that you would see a lion and you, you would either freeze or you would run away, right? Mm. So it's the same with anxiety, you're, you're in a situation that you're on threat, you think you're on the threat, it may not be a visible threat, but you know that, you know, it's something, and this is also to do with PTSD, when people remember their trauma, and the trauma is not happening in front of them, but just to think about it, just seeing a flash of it on a TV or you know something, and that brings up these emotions. And if what they people tend to do is obviously hide away from it. Mm -hmm. it avoidance behavior is a part of anxiety disorder. And what a therapy does is they tend to retrain and retrain the brain to say that yes, you're trying to avoid. We we know that, but it's not going to help you. So yeah. So gently. I mean, I, I think it's it's sometimes hard to do it on your own. So that's yeah. when you need. To yeah, so facing facing your fear would be the way forward with anxiety, overcoming anxiety disorder. Yeah. I guess it's the same with lots of other things as well, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Any more questions before we take a short break? Okay. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. So we'll have about 10, uh, 15 minutes break and we'll gather again.